Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Inshallah, today we are covering from first number 105 of Surah Al-Nisa, Surah number 4. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, wa kafa wa salam wa ala ibadhi wa ala ibadhi wa salam wa ala sayyidi wa sayyidi wa khatim al anbiya wa ala alihi wa sayyidi wa sahabihi wa tafiyya amma ba'd. Fa'a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. إنا أنزلنا إليك الكتاب بالحق لتحكم بين الناس بما أراك الله ولا تكن للخائنين خصيما واستغفر الله إن الله كان غفورا رحيما ولا تجادل عن الذين يختانون أنفسهم إن الله لا يحب من كان خوانا أثيما يستخفون من الناس ولا يستخفون من الله وهو معهم إذ يبيتون ما لا يرضى من القول وكان الله بما يعملون محيطا ها أنتم هؤلاء جادلتم عنهم في الحياة الدنيا فمن يجادل الله عنهم يوم القيامة أم من يكون عليهم وكيلا ومن يعمل سوءا أو يظلم نفسه ثم يستغفر الله يجد الله غفورا رحيما ومن يكسب إثما فإنما يكسبه على نفسه وكان الله عليما حكيما ومن يكسب خطيئة أو إثما ثم يرمي به بريئا فقد احتمل بهتانا وإثما مبينا ولولا فضل الله عليك ورحمته لهمت طائفة منهم أن يذلوك وما يذلون إلا أنفسهم وما يضرونك من شيء وأنزل الله عليك الكتاب والحكمة وعلمك ما لم تكن تعلم وكان فضل الله عليك عظيما لا خير في كثير من نجواهم إلا من أمر بصدقة أو معروف أو صلاح بين الناس ومن يفعل ذلك ابتغاء مرضات الله فسوف نؤتيه أجرا عظيما ومن يشاطط الرسول من بعد ما تبين له الهدى ويتبع غير سبيل المؤمنين لوله ما تولى ونصبه جهنم وساء بصيرا صدق الله العظيم إن شاء الله تلين يقرن كل آيات in the first of these ten, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ لِتَحْكُمَ مَيْنَ النَّاسِ لِمَا أَرَأَكَ اللَّهُ وَلَا تَكُنْ لِلْخَائِنِينَ خَسِيمًا Indeed, we have revealed to you, O Muhammad, the book in truth, so you may judge between the people by that which Allah has shown you, and do not be for the deceitful an advocate. During the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Medina Munawwara was being established as the main city of Islam. And all the verdicts were given there. And most of the verdicts that were given were given in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu that was used as the place of the Prophet Sallallahu would give the verdicts. But if someone was established guilty in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu generally everyone in Medina Munawwara would come to know of it. Which would mean now people would look at this person in a different angle or sometimes people would say, you know, what is this person doing? What is he thinking? They would sometimes people would come to conclusions about people, become judgmental, like we do today as well. So what happened was that these people, in order to save themselves from being convicted as criminals, or as those who are doing wrong, they would present their case to the Prophet in a deceitful manner. Sometimes it would be done in a manner where they were so sharp at their speech, because they were the lawyers, they had to present their own cases. They would speak, speak with such such you know, uh, quickness and such power, they were so you know, smart in speaking that they would at times fool the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would give another verdict. And then at times, rather than just twisting and turning words, sometimes these people would actually up front accuse another person. I didn't do it, he didn't. And they would lie. Now obviously these people were not, they were not the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Most of these people were hypocrites. Most of these people were hypocrites, and this is the opinion of most of the Mufassirin. They say most of these people who did this in the court where they would lie to the Prophet by their speech, or for example, they would accuse someone else. Most of these people are hypocrites, and there were some people who were new to Islam. Some people who were still new, and they were new to Islam, they weren't used to all of this. So they were still settling, and their character was being developed, their etiquettes were being developed, and in that process they made these mistakes. So Allah Azza wa Jalla revealed this ayah, with regards to an incident that took place during that time. There was a very important incident. There was a person, he went for a robbery. He went to a house, he got inside, he picked up a bag. Now inside the bag there was flour. There was flour for making bread. And also inside that bag there was a shield. 
So he took the shield of that person, not the shield, the armor of that person, he put it inside the bag, and inside the bag there was already flour in there. Now he put that bag, he hauled the bag on his back, and he ran out. Now he went that night to his house. After reaching home, he said, you know what? These people may find out that it's me somehow. You know, the, 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 the robber always feels guilty. The one who's stealing, he always feels guilty. Whether he, there's any chance of him getting caught or not, he's always going to live with guilt. So he says, you know, rather than me getting caught by these people, what, should, what I should do is that they're going to come search tomorrow, and it's very likely they may come to my house to search for whatever reason. So he said, let me go drop this off to someone else. So that same night, he went to another guy's house. He went to this Jewish man's house, he said to him, my dear friend, that guy said, it's so late at night, what are you doing at my house? He said, I need to give you something, can you keep it for me? He said, okay. He said, how long do you want me to keep it for? He said, keep it for a few days, and I'll come and take it. So he left it there. Now the next morning, the person who was robbed, he woke up, and his stuff's missing, and these armors were very expensive. Even today, you go, to the, you, go you try to buy an armor, proper armor, it's very expensive. That was a lot of money. Now, he's searching for his armor, and he realizes that, that not only is armor missing, but what else is missing? <coughs> the flower bag. So he's worried. Now when he's searching around, he realizes that the robber made a mistake. What was the mistake the robber made? The robber did not know that in the flower bag there was a hole. <laughs> so there was a direct trail. So he followed the trail, followed the trail, followed the trail, he came to the guy's house, and he came with a group of Sahaba. They all came together. When they came to his house, they said, where is it? He said, where is what? They said, where is the... What do you call this? Where is this? The bag with the, with the flower and the, and the armor. He said, I don't have anything. Check my house. So they searched inside out and they couldn't find anything. Then what happened was that they, he said, why are you guys searching me? Look where the trail continues. Look, it continues there too. <laughs> so they said, okay. So they continued following that trail until they arrived at the Jewish man's house. They said to him, we want to search your house. We have a search warrant. We're here to search. Search what? He said, there was a robbery and we have reason to believe that the, the goods are in your house. So they came inside and they searched and they found it. He said, that's not mine. He said, that guy, last night he came and dropped it off. So the Sahaba said to that, that Munafiq, did you do it? The person who was, who was quote unquote Muslim said, did you do it? He said, I promise I didn't do anything. He, I have nothing to do with this. That's his stuff. Who goes to someone's house so late at night to drop off a bag? He should know better that I was robbing something if I came that late at night. Now there's a debate going on here. Who did the robbery? The Jewish man is saying that he robbed it and dropped it off to my house at that time. And this Muslim person is saying, that the Jewish man did the robbery, but on the way to, in order to, you know, cover up things, he made a detour to my house to make you guys think I did it. So he kind of, like this. So they brought the case to the Prophet ﷺ. So now what happened was that the Muslim person, this hypocrite, this Muslim, quote-unquote Muslim, this hypocrite, what he did was, he went to his community people and he said to his home, his little tribe, he said to them that you guys have to defend me. Is if I convicted, which I didn't do anything, he's saying, I didn't do anything. And if I do get convicted, the stain of the sin or the stain of this crime will come on the entire community. So you guys have to defend me in court. So his tribe people said, if you didn't do it, we're going to stand by your side. And the entire tribe, they came together and they presented their case in front of the Prophet ﷺ. And this became a very serious issue in Medina Marawana now. Who did the robbery? Now when this situation was taking place, on this side you have this Jewish man without any support. And on this side you have this hypocrite with his entire nation there, and they're providing so much proof, so much proof, so much proof, until the scholars of Hadith Ibn Kathir, he says, and also Imam Suyuti, and you'll find in almost all the tafsirs of the Qur'an, where the Mufassirin, they say that it was very close, it was almost possible the Prophet was going to give the verdict against the Jewish man. It was that close. And then Allah Azza wa Jalla revealed his eyes. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ مِنْ حَقِّ لِتَحْكُمَ مَيْنَ النَّاسِ بِمَا أَرَاكَ اللَّهِ وَلَا تَكُلْ لِلْخَائِنِينَ خَصِيمًا وَاسْتَغْفِرِ اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا وَلَا تُجَادِلْ عَنِ الَّذِينَ يَخْتَانُونَ أَنفُسَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ مَنْ كَانَ خَوَّانًا أَثِيمًا يَسْتَخْفُونَ مِنَ النَّاسِ مَا لَا يَسْتَخْفُونَ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَهُوَ مَعَهُمْ إِذْ يُبَيِّتُونَ مَا لَا يَرْضَى مِنَ الْقَوْلِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِمَا يَعْمَلُ مُحِيطًا هَا أَنْتُمْ هَؤُلَاءِ جَادَلْتُمْ عَنْهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَمَن يُجَادِلُ اللَّهَ عَنْهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَمَّن يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَكِيلًا and these basically almost like seven to eight ayat were revealed regarding this incident. Now, before we translate these ayahs and we understand them, there's one or two points that I wish to make that we learn from this. Okay, the first thing that we learn is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it was impossible for him to have the knowledge of the unseen unless Allah had given it to him. Mm -hmm. Some people they make a claim that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam al itla without any conditions at all. He had knowledge of the unseen. He had knowledge of the unknown. 
which is something that we reserve only for Allah. Only Allah has that. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Illa manir min rasulin. Only Allah shares that knowledge with manir tada, who He chooses, mir rasulin, from a prophet. Whoever Allah chooses from a prophet, He shares that knowledge with. Otherwise, knowledge by default only belongs to Allah. وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا And they cannot encompass the knowledge of Allah except for that which Allah wishes. That's the knowledge of Allah. No prophet, no nabi has the knowledge of the unseen unless it is given to him by Allah. Had the Prophet ﷺ had the knowledge of the unseen, he would have dealt with this case very easily. But it was very possible, as all the Mufassirin say, the Hadith says that he almost gave the verdict in favor of the Jewish man. The second thing that we learned, the Prophet ﷺ had every reason to convict a Jewish man if he was a Jew hater. You know, today, the Orientalists, what's the biggest objection they have against Islam? Those Orientalists who claim to have studied Sirah, right? Those non-Muslims who claim they've studied Sirah and claim they are masters in Islamic history, what's the biggest objection they make? They say Muhammad was a Jew hater. These are the exact words they use, right? Muhammad ﷺ was a Jew hater. Now that's not true. Had this been true, the Prophet ﷺ would have taken the first moment to convict this Jewish man. But did the Prophet ﷺ convict him? No. And had Islam been a biased religion against the Jews, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why would He reveal these ayahs to bring the bara of the Jews, right, of this Jewish man, to put this man in safety? This ayah itself, the story itself, is such a powerful story because we learned that the justice of the Prophet. And this justice then trinkled down into the Sahaba. Umar al Khattab radiallahu ta'ala during his khilafah, they were, there was a man doing tawaf of the Kaaba. And while he was doing tawaf of the Kaaba, he accidentally stepped on another person's foot. It happens, you know, you're walking, you accidentally step on someone's foot. He stepped on someone else's foot. The man's foot that he stepped on was a very rich man, and he just accepted Islam recently. A very rich man, just accepted Islam, thought money was everything, came, from, came to the haram, was doing his tawaf. And when this poor sahabi stepped on his foot, what did this rich sahabi do? Not rich sahabi, this rich man, what did he do? He slapped that poor sahabi on the face. He slapped him so hard, how dare you step on my foot? Now this poor man, if they ever needed justice, they would go to the Khalifa. He came to Umar ibn Khattab and he said, Ya Umar, that man slapped me. Umar said, bring him here. He came in front of Umar and Umar said to that Sahabi, slap him back. In front of him. So that man said, Wallahi, that guy's never going to touch my face. He touched my face, watch what happens. Umar said, look, if you are in my ruling, he will slap you back. I'm going to give you 24 hours to just get your mind straight. Come back tomorrow and take the slap and go home. <laughs> so overnight this man, he ran away. He ran away, he became murtad, he left Islam. He became murtad, he left Islam. He went away. And after he went away, the Sahaba, they came to Umar radiallahu anh, they said to him, Umar, look, how, look what you did, look how bad of a, look how bad of a ruler you are. Look, the munafiqin, they begin to, and these people begin to point fingers at him. They look, you could have, you made a person into a murtad just because you imposed Islam and ruling on him. Umar radiallahu anh said, Wallahi, the deen of Allah is not, is not in need of anyone. He said, if they want to abide by the deen of Allah, you're welcome. But if you think you're above the law of Allah, then we don't need you either. And then he recited the verse of the Qur'an, that, Wallahu al-ghaniyu wa antum al Allah is independent, and you will always be dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But however, Umar radiallahu an, he didn't let that person go like that. Umar radiallahu an, he then sent two sahaba, he said, go and find him. And go to that person, and tell him that Umar is willing to do whatever he can do personally to bring you back to Islam. You, when, you know, that verdict in its place, but on a personal level, on a one-to-one level, on an individual level, Umar wishes to help you bring you back to Islam. So those sahaba, they went there and they told him, and that man, he said that, tell Omar to come to me himself and ask me and then I'll accept Islam. <coughs> so they came and they told Omar radiallahu anh. And Omar radiallahu anh, he started the journey. He got on his animal and he began to travel to him. He said, if Amir al has to go to people to ask them to accept Islam, then I'm willing to do that. Because that was a personal activist, you understand? On a personal level. And Omar radiallahu anh, on the way there, he got news that that person died. In the state of, you know, in the state of kufr, without iman. And Omar radiallahu anh said, Wallahi, I would have traveled to him as many as times as he asked me if he was willing to accept Islam. And there are many rulings that you derive from this hadith of, of, of this man. One of the things that we learn is the core principle of da'wah. How important it is to the da'wah. That's why Imam Ghazali, with regards to da'wah, he said that if one person leaves this world without iman, it is possible Allah will hold the entire ummah responsible for it on the day of judgment. 
if Allah, one person leaves this world without iman, it's possible Allah will hold the entire ummah responsible on the day of judgment for that one person dying without iman. Which shows us how big of an obligation they have on their shoulder. On our shoulders, yet we're so lazy. No one wants to do that. No one wants to do that. How like it's such, even though it's such a big obligation. And those of us that are doing da'wah, mashallah, we're doing da'wah within Muslims. On the non-Muslims, no one wants to do da'wah. Hardly anyone. You know, honestly, in my, in my vision, if someone asks me, who are the people that you've seen that do most with da'wah with non-Muslims? In my opinion, it's the college students. I've seen the college guys, these guys do the most da'wah with non-Muslims. And how so? <coughs> By their Islamic awareness week. Once a year they have an Islamic awareness week where they make an effort to call non-Muslims toward the masjid and make them, you know, explain Islam to them, explain deen to them. But beyond that, there is no, you know, on a, on a consistent level across the nation where we can find an actual effort being made for da'wah purposes. Okay, so that was the second example that I gave. Another example of the Sahaba being so just when it came to the order of Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was during the Khilafah of Ali radiallahu anhu. Ali radiallahu anhu, he saw a Jewish man wearing an armor. When he saw the Jewish man, he said, that's my armor there. The Jewish man said, no, it's mine. Who's the Amir al-Mu'mineen right now, by the way? Ali, Ali. Ali radiallahu anhu is Amir al-Mu'mineen now. And he's making the claim that that Jewish man has my armor. The Jewish man said, if you think it's yours, let's take the case to court. Okay? They take the case to the court. The judge there, his name was Qadi Shuraih. Qadi Shuraih, he said to the Jewish man, what is your claim? He said, my claim. No, he asked Ali radiallahu anhu, who was the claimant? Who was making the claim? <laughs> Ali radiallahu anhu was making the claim. That that's my armor. And then he said to the Jewish man, what, what is your position? He goes, I'm defending. I'm the defendant. He's the one making the claim. I'm the defendant. So now in Islam, the one who makes the claim must provide Witness. proof. He must provide proof for it. Mm -hmm. And the, the defendant, if there is no proof provided, what does the defendant have to do? Take it off. So for example, if you go to the court, Hassan comes to the court and says, you know, the sheikh stole my water bottle. Okay, so the judge will say to him, what's your proof? So he will say, I have that receipt, and the receipt has the exact same barcode, and that receipt, that proof that he gives, the bayina that he gives, al-bayina to al-mudda'i, that proof that he gives will then be enough for him. Or for example, he provides two witnesses that when I went to the store, that time Midhat and Mazin were there too, they saw me brought this water, they saw me purchase this water, now these two people serving as witnesses in his cause will now mean that that is proof. He has to provide proof. Now, if he cannot provide proof, then now what happens? The judge will ask me, Hussein, whose water is this? I'll say, Wallahi, this is my water. I'm not saying this is my water. I'll give you an example. Someone put this water here. My Allah, give me Right? You know, the, you know the, I swear by Allah, this is my water. I take the, oh, uh, I take the Yameen. Yameen is in? Oh, I take the oath. Okay. I take the oath. Once I take the oath, if he cannot provide proof, who will the judge give the water to? Hussein, this is your water, go, go drink it, enjoy yourself, go, go, go to something, go to that water. Okay, so now, Ali radiallahu anhu went to the court, he's making the claim that that's my armor. The Jewish man saying, I'm the defendant, it's mine. So Ali radiallahu anhu, Qadi Shari'ah says to him, bring your witnesses for it. Now the Jewish man says, what? He gets his paycheck from the Amir al-Mu'mineen. That Qadi, who, where does he get his paycheck from? Mm -hmm. Ali radiallahu anhu, he gets a paycheck from the, from the Baytul Mal. And he has the courage to demand from Ali radiallahu anhu witnesses. Ali radiallahu anhu says, I have two witnesses. He brings forward his slave, Maysara. He says, Maysara, he's my witness. Qadi Shuraykh says, I will not accept Maysara radiallahu anhu as your witness. He says, why not? He says, because he's your dependent, he's your slave. And it's possible a dependent may lie on behalf of the one he's dependent on. We're not going to accept it. He said, okay. I have a second witness, and he said, Hassan radiallahu anhu, the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Qadi Shuray says, Wallahi, I can never doubt this child lying, for he is indeed the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But again, I can't accept his witnessing on your behalf. For he again is your dependent, he's your, he's your son. A son cannot give witness on behalf of his father. He can't witness for his father in the court. So he says to the Jewish man, okay, he doesn't have any witnesses. Your turn now. That guy takes the oath, this is my armor. And he walks out. Now when he walks out, this is just, the, the whole world just saw a true example of what, of what justice is. That Amir al <clears throat> look what happened to him. And what happens after he leaves, the, Je the Jewish man comes to Ali radiallahu anhu and he says, Wallahi, this is your dira. Dira means your arm. He says, Wallahi, this is your arm. And he said, a religion that has so much justice, only a fool will stay away from it. I'm ready to accept Islam. And he reads the Shahada. 
and he accepts Islam just by seeing what happened in the court. This is the justice of Islam. People think that Islam has double standards. Well, why there are no double standards? If you read the books of history, you'll find the story of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu And I've told you guys the story before too, right? Where the lady came to his house in the, in the afternoon time, and Umar radiallahu was resting, and she knocked on his door, and he stood up, and she said to her, she said to him, that are you the Amir al-Mu'mineen? He said, yes. He said, then she then asked him, but aren't you responsible of taking care of the Ummah? He said, yes. He, she asked him, that, will you take revenge on behalf of a lady if someone has done something wrong for her? He said, Wallahi, I am Amir al-Mu'mineen. If you prove that person wrong, I'll take care of him. She said, come with me. He said, where are you going? She said, I'm taking you to the house of a criminal. And he said, what's the crime? He said, this, stom- this child in my stomach is his crime. Committed zina. So Amir al-Mu'mineen said, take me to that person's house. Let me take care of this guy. So on the way there, Amir al-Mu'mineen said to this lady that I recognize the pathway you're taking me. I've been this way before. Where are you going? She said, don't worry, come with me. So she took him to the house and she said, that's the guy's house right there. That guy lives in that house. So Amir al-Mu'mineen was shocked. The reason why he was shocked is because he knew that house belonged to him. He knew very well who that house belonged to. It belonged to his own son. And he said, are you sure that's the house? She said, wallahi, that's the guy. So Amin al-Mu'mineen Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu went inside and he opened the door and he went to his son. He said to him, did you do this? And he pointed towards a lady. And he could have lied to his father. Amin al-Mu'mineen was Amin al-Mu'mineen. He said, I did it, yes. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he pulled him out of the house and he took him to the market and he gathered everyone around. And he, been, he said, give him the hundred lashes. And the other sahaba there, they said that we are senior sahaba. We give you permission, Amin al-Mu'mineen, to waive the penalty from your son. Waive the penalty from him. Leave him. And Amin al-Mu'mineen said, forget waiving the penalty. I'm going to give him the penalty with my own hands. And there was a position appointed called the Jallad. The Jallad was the one who would give the, who would give the punishment. So he said to the Jallad, give me the whip. And he took the whip from his hand and he gave the punishment himself. Just so he can show to people, just so that he can show to people that the Khalifa and the Muslim ruler has no bias, even if it's from his own, walau kanu uli qurba. Even if, even if it's from the own family members, right? And he then, he lashed him. And after, when he was lashing him, his health became very bad. His son, his son wasn't a strong man. And Umar radiallahu was a very strong man. When he's lashing him, they say his son, he passed away at 70 lashes, 60 to 70 lashes. He, he died. And while he was dying, the other sahaba said to him, stop. He said, no, I will give him the 400. And he gave 30 extra lashes after his son passed away. And then he put the lash down and he ran to his son. And he picked his son up. And he held his son in his lap and he cried and said to him, Wallahi, I love you. He said, I love you. Don't think I did this because I hate you. He said, but I want you to know that when you meet the Prophet wasallam, tell him and inform him that Umar, when I departed this world, Umar was upholding the deen. Convey that message to him. Right? And this is one of the hadith that the scholars use who say, who believe and support the opinion of Sima'ul Mawta. Sima'ul Mawta means the dead can hear. Can the dead hear or not? That's a discussion. When someone dies, can they hear people from the world or not? So amongst the proofs that are given, this is one of the hadith. Another hadith that's given, because they use this narration in interview with Umar radiallahu anhu. What did he do? He spoke to his son after he passed away. And the other proof that they give is another very common proof is from the battle of Badr. That when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after the battle of Badr was opened, he took the bodies of the enemy, he gathered them together, and they were all put inside the well. Badr was the name of the well. They put it inside the well of Badr. And when they put it in there, before they left, and this is a sahih hadith, you'll find this in all narrations. Umar of the Allah wants a narration, you won't find it in most of the hadith books. You'll find it in certain history books. So that I understand some people may not hold the weight for that narration as may be required, in a, in especially in a fiqhi discussion. Okay, but it's still there in the books of history. But this hadith of the Badr, you'll find in every authentic book almost. Where the Prophet said before, after he put their bodies in the inside the well, he then said to the people, he said to the, the dead bodies, he said to them that, do not blame me on the day of judgment, for indeed I warned you before I fought you. He spoke to him. He said, don't blame me on the day of judgment, for I warned you before I fought you. And the Prophet ﷺ warned them for almost 15 years. How many years? 13 years of Mecca al-Mukarama and 2 years of Medina al That's 15 years. He warned them before he fought against them. Right? Which, in itself is a big, which, which in itself is a big lesson for us to learn. So these are so many examples. We can go through so many, so many examples of how the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba were taught to give complete justice and to not be biased towards any side. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you have to keep in mind, the judge is only made... So the Prophet ﷺ didn't do anything wrong. If he was feeling inclined to give a verdict against the Jewish man, it wasn't because of his own desires, it was because of the way this Munafiq's party was, were presenting their case. You guys understand? Sometimes you can go to court and hire a very nice lawyer, and he'll win your case for you. Even in Islamic court, 
You can go to an Islamic court. Your representative could be a very smart man who knows how to speak. If he represents you and makes you win the case, and the judge gives a verdict that those $10 million should go in your pocket rather than that person's part, pocket, do you have the right to take that money home? Yes or no? Even if the judge gives a verdict, do you have the permission to take that money home or not? No. If you are wrong, you are wrong. And the judge is only mukallaf, he's only responsible of what he sees, what he hears, what his senses tell him. He's only mukallaf of the zahir. Zahir means that which is apparent. The judge is only responsible of that which is apparent. Many times this happens, some sister comes or some brother comes and they say, Mufti sahab, my, my, my husband said to me, talaq three times. What's the ruling? He said to me, talaq a hundred times. Forget three. three, three is controversial, okay? He said to me, three times talaq every day for one hundred days. <laughs> three hundred talaqs he gave me. For example, what's the ruling? So he say, my friend, the divorce occurred. Okay. So then they say, can you write it on a piece of paper? Of course. Right here. Done. Now they take it and they go to the husband and say, look, I'm divorced from you. Now the husband comes to the, the sheikh, he says, how did you get divorced? So uh, then you said, oh, he said that you, you said I, I divorced, I, you gave her talaq three times a day for 100 days, the divorce occurs. Then he said, look, I didn't say I divorced you, I said I'm going to divorce you. Mm-hmm. What does he say? I didn't say to you I divorced you, I said to her that I'm going to divorce you. And I didn't say it three times a day, I said it ten times a day. <laughs> or one thousand times. But I didn't say, I'm, I did divorce you, what did I say? Mm-hmm. I'm going to divorce you. And if anyone knows anything about fiqh, you'll know that if you say, I'm going to divorce you, does that divorce occur? Mm-hmm. That, that divorce doesn't occur, right? Or if he says that, you know, um, if he says, for example, Wallahi, I divorce you, right? If he says, Wallahi, I divorce you, something like this, the divorce doesn't occur, okay? Or he says, oh, for example, not Wallahi, he says, Inshallah, I'll divorce you. <laughs> This is a masala. If a person says inshallah and then he divorces his wife, that divorce won't occur. If I divorce you inshallah, that won't occur. The, the, the divorce of inshallah doesn't occur. Anyways, okay. So now, now this happens. Now I see the case and I say, oh, well, the verdict that I gave was based off what that person gave. Now that you brought more information, as long as both, both parties acknowledge this, now the verdict changes. That's why they say, never give a judgment until you hear both sides of the story. Right? And I'm telling this to you guys because in your family sometimes you'll have to take the responsibility of playing the judge. That'll happen sometimes. Right? That where people will come, both parties will come. He did this, that person did this. And you have to become a judge then. And first of all, you should not be a judge. If someone comes to you and tries to make you into a judge, what should you do? Don't get involved. Because sometimes people, they give judgments from their hearts, not from their minds. And if a judge is going to think by his heart, he's going to butcher the deen. I dealt with this case before too. There was a person who was appointed as an arbiter between you know, a husband and wife. They were having marriage issues. They went to a friend, they appointed that person as an arbiter. Now the arbiter, before he took his decision, he decided to come to me and take some advice off me for some fiqh issues. <clears throat> so when he came and he presented the case in front of me, I said to him, look, this is the fiqh of this matter. This is the ruling right here. Now even though that person knew the fiqh, that based off the fiqh that divorce occurred and that marriage was over, it was long gone over. But because that person was so zealous and so emotional, he was still trying to find ways to get them back together. And the ways that he was using to get them back together were haram. And I explained, brother, it's not in your hands, it's not in my hands. It's the sharia. You have to leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hukum is not for me and you, it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to leave it to the sharia. Right? So sometimes people, they get overzealous and they start using their heart and they want to, oh, the, the spirit of the deen is to bring them back together. The spirit of the deen is to bring them back together. That's what I want too. That's what you want too. Everyone wants that. But let's say, for example, Islamically, the divorce did occur. Let's use the example. He did say, I divorced you three times a day for 100 days. So now what your spirit is, it really doesn't matter now. Do you understand? He said the words, and those words constitute a divorce, and a divorce means a divorce. That means it's end of marriage. So you have to be careful. If you've been appointed as a judge between people, first thing, don't do it. Okay? Because the Prophet says, مَنْ جُعِلَ قَادِيًا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ فَقَدْ ضُبِحَ بِغَيْرِ سِكِينَ That the one that has been appointed as a judge between two people, then he has been sacrificed without a knife. What has happened to him? فَقَدْ ذُبِحَ He's been sacrificed بِغَيْنِ سِكِّينَ بِغَيْنِ سِكِّينَ means without the knife. He was sacrificed without the knife. He was a goner. Right? So being a judge is a very big responsibility. It's a very, very big responsibility. And only that person should be a judge between people who has wisdom, a person who has knowledge, a person who has experience. They know how to deal with things. And even the judge shouldn't give verdicts themselves. The judge should have a shura team. You guys know what a shura team is? A body to consult from, an advisory body. Where then you take advice of them. The deen is very serious. Don't make it into something something simple. And if by chance you're even giving preliminary advice, just 
Initial advice, beginning, beginning advice, make sure you hear both sides of the story. Because sometimes you'll be shocked by only hearing one side of the story, how misguided you can be. So these verses right here, most of today's, uh, most of today's ayat are in context to that incident that I narrated at the beginning regarding the armor. We'll translate these ayat and inshallah we'll understand everything. Allah Azza He says, Indeed we reveal to you, O Muhammad, the book in truth, so you may judge between the people by that which Allah has shown you. And do not be for the deceitful and advocate. And seek forgiveness of Allah. Indeed, Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. And do not argue on behalf of those who deceive themselves. Indeed, Allah loves not one who is habitually sinful and deceiver. Right? The people that the Munatuk he was trying to defend himself. So Allah said, Don't help him. Don't help defending him. They conceal their evil intentions and deeds from the people, but they cannot conceal them from Allah. And he is with them in his knowledge when they spend the night in such as he does not accept of speech. So while they're speaking at night, Allah Azza wa Jalla hears of the speech even then. And ever is Allah of what they do encompassing. Here you are, those who argue on behalf in their in this worldly life, but who will argue with Allah for them on the day of judgment? Or who will then be their representative? So in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi maybe you can Fool, or maybe in front of some judge, you can pull it off, you know, pull some nasty case and fool the people. Right? What do they call lawyers? G. So, <laughs> I'm not making a judgment here, otherwise, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna get killed from that chair there. They're gonna shoot me. Lawyers are liars. What they say, Allah knows if that's true or not, right? Whether the lawyers are liars or not. But sometimes, you know, people get, they, they get overzealous, like I was saying, defending their case, and they make lies too. It's happened many times. We don't want that to happen within ourselves. So Allah says here that they hide. Maybe you can fool the judge. It's possible. You may be able to fool the judge. But can you fool Allah? Because all the judgments that are given in this world will once again have to be dealt with in the hereafter in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there you can't fool Allah. Then Allah will hold you responsible. That's why he says here, here, here you are, those who argue on their behalf in this worldly life, but who will argue with Allah for them on the day of resurrection? And who will then be the representative? And whoever does a wrong, suan, and whoever does a wrong, or he oppresses himself, and then he asks Allah for repentance, for forgiveness, he will find Allah forgiving and merciful. If you've made this mistake in the past, what should you do? Ask Allah for forgiveness. If you've done something wrong like this, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, Allah will forgive your shortcomings. And the hadith of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he sorry, he says in the hadith that should I tell you, ala uqbirukum bi afdali min darajat al-siyam wa al-salat wa al-sadqa, should I not inform you of a rank which is higher than that of the fasting, the prayer, and the, of the one who's praying and the one who gives charity? Qalu bala. They said, of course, O Messenger of Allah. Qalu bala ya Rasulullah. Qala islahu dhat al-bain. He said that that is joining between two people. By joining between people. Allah Azza wa Jal will, um, will, will, actually that's hadith is for the next ayah. And the, there's one hadith here, let me see if I can find it. Okay, here it is. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, that, an ibn Abbasin, it is narrated from Ibn Abbas, anahu qala fi hadith ayah, that he narrated, that he said regarding this ayah, and the tafsir of this ayah, he said that, that akhbar Allahu ibadahu bi afwihi wa hilmihi wa karamihi wa wasi'ati rahmihi wa maghfiratihi, فَمَنْ أَذْنَبَ ذَمَّا صَغِيرًا أَوْ كَانَ كَبِيرًا ثُمَّ يَسْتَغْفِرِ اللَّهَ يَجِدِ اللَّهَ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا وَلَوْ كَانَتْ ذُنُوبَهُ أَعْظَمُ مِنَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَالْجِبَالِ Right, this is the hadith that I was referring to. It is narrated by Ibn Abbas of Allah. He says, through this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that if you commit a major sin or a minor sin, but as long as you say sorry to Allah, all you have to say is, I'm sorry. If you can say to Allah, I'm sorry, Allah will forgive your sin no matter how big that sin is, even if it's greater than the skies, the earth, and even the mountains. And another hadith narrated by Ali Allah one, he says that I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi I have never heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying something to me, which was more beneficial than the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he said that there is not a Muslim who commits a sin, but then after committing the sin, he does wudu, he prays to Raka, and he repents to Allah, but Allah will forgive him. As Ali radiallahu anh says, this is the best thing I heard from the Prophet sallallahu That if a Muslim commits a sin, what does he do? Wudu, he prays how many rakah? 
two rakat and then he repents to Allah, Allah will forgive the sin. This is what we call Salat al tawbah What do we call this? Salat al tawbah the Salat of repentance. That you pray these two rakat specifically to seek repentance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This Salat al tawbah should be prayed daily. You should pray the Salat al tawbah two rakat every day after Isha Salat. And if you can, encourage yourself to pray every day after Isha Salat, at least every Jummah. Every Jummah, when you come to the masjid, make a habit of praying Salat al tawbah our, our pious scholars of the past, I'm telling you, not even the pious scholars, even our elders, you go back to India, Pakistan, and the subcontinent, you'll see them. They use Friday as a special day. Friday was what? It was a special day. And how is it a special day? That they would pray Salat al tasbih on this day. They would come early, and every week they pray Salat al tasbih Every week they read Surah Kahab. Every week, you know, they come early to the masjid and they spend so much time. One of my good friends was also sitting here and his father, mashallah, is a very good service. You know, he gives so much service to our masjid. May Allah give him a long life. May Allah accept his efforts. You know, Brother Sharif Sahib, he does so much for our community. So his son was with me and we were, on a le- we were, on a, we were going for a lecture. And he said to me, Kutsab, can I tell you how my grandfather passed away? My father's father. I said, tell me. He said, it was a day of Jummah and we got him ready. And after he did his ghusl and everything, I believe he arrived in the masjid, if I'm correct, and then he went into ruku and salah, and that was the end of his life. SubhanAllah. Right? Look at these people, they pass away during salah time. They're praying their salah, he's in ruku, and that was the, that was the end of this individual's life. Right? Allah Azza wa Jalla, He blesses these people, because they use these opportunities. Right? They use these days to, you know, that Friday was something special for them. That's what the Prophet says, the one who... Who, who fulfills the etiquette of Friday of Jummah by doing the salah early, you know, by doing the ghusl early and arriving to the masjid early. You guys know the hadith, right? Does the miswak and reads the surah kahap and prays the salah. The one who goes through the etiquettes of Jummah, what does the hadith say? That Jummah will forgive his sins between that Jummah and the previous. Yes, no? That's hadith, right? Kana kafaratunahu fima fima mada. Allah will for, use that Jummah to forgive that which has passed by from the previous week. So here we see. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's showing us in this ayah regarding tawbah that Allah azza wa jalla says that whoever commits a sin or oppresses himself and then he asks Allah for forgiveness, he will find Allah is forgiving. Allah is merciful. And whoever earns, meaning commits a sin, only earns it against himself, and Allah is ever knowing and wise. But whoever earns an offense or a sin and then blames it on an innocent person. He commits a sin, and what does he do? You know, kids, they do this all the time. I didn't do it, he did it. One brother, he says to really, he ate the hot dogs. Right? That whoever earns an offense or a sin and then blames it on an innocent person has taken upon himself a slander and ithmam mubina, a slander and a manifest sin. Mubina means manifest, it's clear. A clear sin. He's taken upon himself a clear sin. In these next two verses, Allah Azza wa Jalla, he mentions his favorite to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, وَلَوْلَا فَضْرُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ وَرَحْمَتُهُ لَهَمَّ الطَّائِفَةٌ مِّنْ مَعِيُّ ذِلُّكُ And I had, I then continuing on from the previous story, that story, keep that incident in mind, okay? And if it was not for the favor of Allah upon you, O Muhammad, and His mercy, a group of them would have, would have been determined to mislead you. What were those people trying to do? They were trying to misguide, they were determined to misguide the Prophet ﷺ. And what saved the Prophet ﷺ? The favor and the mercy of Allah. That's what saved the Prophet ﷺ for making that mistake. But the reality is that they cannot mislead you. But they do not mislead except themselves. Whenever they try to mislead someone, they're not misleading you, they're just misleading themselves. And Allah has revealed to you the book. And wisdom. And He has taught you that which you do not know. Allah has taught this to the Prophet ﷺ. He was unaware of it. This, informa- this information, He was unaware of it. Allah taught it to the Prophet ﷺ. And ever has the favor of Allah upon you been great. And no good is there, no good is there in much of their private conversation. You know their private talking that these guys do, these munafiqeen, most of it's bakwas, it's a waste. They're talking, they're plotting against Muslims as opposed to planning for Muslims. Okay? So Allah says, there is not much good in their private conversation. Except for those who enjoin charity. O ma'rufin, or that which is right. O oh, Islahim made a nas or conciliation between two people. And whoever does that, seeking the pleasure of Allah, we are going to give him a great reward. One thing I want to mention in this ayah, and then we have one ayah, and then we're finished. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, that these are three things that, that there should be secret planning for. You know that secret planning or the private planning? Private planning, generally we shouldn't do private planning. Whenever we have discussions, we try to keep them open. Right? Because sometimes our private discussions can go the wrong way. But there are three things in which we should do private planning. First is, right, Amara bi sadaqatin, planning fundraisers. Right? You're planning some kind of fundraising event, some kind of, you know, sadaqah event, where you're encouraging people that we have to create a way that Muslims are going to give in sadaqah. So Farhan says, you know what, I think we should do a bake sale. And then someone else says, you know, I think we should do this. Someone says, I think we should do that. So. so we put four or five opinions together, and this is our private planning, and then we said, okay, we're going to use this to encourage people to give sadaqah. Oh, ma'arufin, or for something good. For example, we say, you know what, we realize that the business, the, business, the business ethics of the Muslims are very low. We have to lift them up. How do we do this? So everyone gives their opinion. We have a private planning session. Oh, islah in bayn nas or for example, two of us are sitting together. Me and Omar are sitting together. Omar says that, you know what, so-and-so person isn't talking to so-and-so person. What do we do? So now we'll make a plan. That we'll make them talk together through this plan of ours. We'll make some, you know, some plan together. So in these terms, if it's something good, you can have private conversations. Private talks to make things good. But if you're planning you know, bad and evil, then be careful because you may think your conversation is private, but Allah knows of all your conversations. So it's not private in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the last ayah, Allah says, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيِّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعُ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُسْلِهِ جَعْلِ الْمَسَاعِ فُسِيرًا And whoever opposes the messenger after guidance has become clear to him and follows other than the way of the believers, we will give him what he has taken and drive him into hell and evil it is, evil it is as a destination. So once it becomes clear to you what Allah and the Rasul want from you, once the deen has become clear to you, now it is completely wrong for a person to go against that. Then we don't go against it, okay? Maybe before we knew it, we made some mistake, Allah will forgive us for that, inshallah. But once we know what's right and wrong, and then we continue to do what's wrong, then we're held accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we don't continue it. This happens sometimes. The guy and the girl, they come and they say, Mufti Sahib, we're getting married. What's the advice that you have? I say, my advice is, don't have music playing during your marriage. Don't dance during your marriage. Don't eat haram during your marriage. Make sure you hold it according to the sunnah. You know, these things, certain things are haram, don't engage in those things. But what do they do? After they ask advice, after they know, then what do they do? They do exactly that. Right? And the best part is, they'll call Mufti Sahib to still lead the nikah too. Come lead the nikah. This happened the other time. You know, our Farid al Maran Sahib from, from this, um, what's the much you call From Jamal Majid. They called him to lead nikah. He led the nikah, and after the nikah, they were playing music. So he got up and he gave them a good lecture. That's what kind of parties we need in Chicago. <laughs> people can get up and tell people. And I heard the same thing Mufti of the Sattar Sahib did too. Well, I'm on him. I heard that once he went to a nikah and someone, these guys were doing some agar bagaram there. And he got up and gave it to them. What are you guys doing? You call scholars to lead your nikah, and then as soon as they... This happened to me when I was a kid. That's, you know, I actually got a very bad image from this because I was a kid then, right? I was maybe nine years old or eight years old, and this happened to me. My father came to visit me in Buffalo, New York. I used to study in Buffalo. And he, after he picked me up, he said, one of my friends are getting married in Toronto, let's go there. Buffalo and Toronto are very close, we one hour and a half away. So hour and a half away we drove, we arrived at the wedding, and they said, oh, we don't have anyone here to read Quran. Who's going to read Quran? So I was a nine-year-old kid, I had memorized, you know, 27, 28 Jews. So they said, okay, ask him to read the Quran. So then they pushed me forward, and I recited Surah Rahman. And while I was reciting, you know, um, th those convertible hijabs, they came up. <laughs> everyone had their hijab up, and everyone sitting there, they're all, everyone listening. And then as soon as literally, this is what impacted me as a child, because I saw hypocrisy in the Muslim ummah then. Right? Being a nine-year-old kid, I didn't know better, and this is what I saw with my eyes, I observed this. That as soon as the lecture came to an end, the brother, after I got off, he made an announcement, he said, Jazakallah khair to our young Hafsah for reciting the Qur'an. For those people who are interested in reading Salah, there's a place at the back, and inshallah, we'll start the rest of the program now. Please, inshallah, you can get started. He pointed to the guy, and the music started right there. <laughs> Literally, and the adhan's being called. And you can hear the adhan in the distance being called, but the music was so loud that it was overpowering the voice of the adhan. And then I said to myself, subhanAllah, look at this. Look over how low we've reached today. That today we made the music overpower the voice of the adhan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from doing this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save our ummah from this. The worst thing is that when you know something is wrong, and then you still do it. That's the worst thing. You know, and this happens a lot in our older community. The young guys too, but the older community. They say, Allah ghafoor, Allah rahim. <laughs> they make a plan that, you know, I have to take a loan. And they say, oh, it's haram, brother, don't do it. He says, Allah ghafoor, Allah rahim. Allah is forgiven, Allah is merciful, He'll take care of you. So that, that, the scholar, remember, I'll tell you guys a principle. The scholars say, two 
Say Allah is ghafur. This is actually a, a masala. This is a verdict, a, a matter written in the books of Tiqq. That for a person to say that before committing a sin is actually taunting the mercy of Allah. <laughs> what do they say this? For a person to say Allah is merciful and then to sin, what are you doing? You're taunting, you're making fun of the mercy of Allah. You're making a joke out of the mercy of Allah. Right? So be careful of doing that. If a person is naive and they make a mistake, Allah is wajal, inshallah, you know, he'll forgive us as long as we repent to him. And when, we, when we're aware of what we're doing, then you have to be very careful. Because Allah says here says very clearly in the Quran that, you know, when, when Allah and the Rasul tell you something and you know it's clear, then do it. Then don't, don't hold on to your desires and say, this is what I think in the deen. Because this happens a lot. We have situations like this all the time. You know, just earlier on today, when I was coming back from teaching my class in London Heights, one young man called me. And literally, I spent almost half an hour to 35, maybe even 40 minutes on the phone explaining to that person how once Allah has made something haram, you can never make it halal again. Right? We were talking about, you know, uh, these homosexual marriages. And I was trying to explain no matter whichever constitution in the world gives permission for it, it can never be permissible. It can never be permissible because Allah has made it clear in the Quran. But then the issue came, but, you know, it's a, it's a right of a minority group. It's a minority right. Right? And just as Muslims, we demand our minority rights, they're demanding minority rights. If they support us in demanding and receiving our minority rights, we should help them in receiving their minority rights. So I said, look, having a right as a minority is accepted. But what that right is now, that's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to know. And what's Allah wa ta'ala? It's like, for example, I have five sons and I give each one five dollars each. Okay? I know one of my sons is going to go buy cigarettes. Does that mean I have to give him five dollars now? Yes or no? I won't give, as a father, I'm not going to give it to him because... Yes, I should be giving them all, but when I realize he's going to use that right in the wrong way, then I'm not going to give it to him, right? So this is something very hard for people in the West to understand, especially our young minds, <coughs> our young guys who go to colleges and universities, because we've been fed a false understanding of freedom of rights. Islam gives freedom of rights too, don't get me wrong here. <coughs> but those things that are haram, there's no such thing as freedom of rights there. <coughs> if you want to make something jais, something permissible that Allah has made prohibited, that's not called freedom of rights, that's called challenging your Lord. What is that called? And we, we, we coin it with such a beautiful word. We say freedom of right. Look how nice that sounds, right? <laughs> that I'm not going to pray why? Because it's freedom of right. That sounds so beautiful. right? Now let's reword that. I'm not going to pray because I'm too proud of myself and I don't have time to lower my head in front of Allah. Now you don't sound good anymore, do you? It's all about your perspective, the way you, the way you coin your words. The cup is half full or it's half empty. It's for you to decide. It's for your perspective. But what Allah has made haram, that's haram. And you can't allow that to happen. Once you know something's haram, you stay away from it. Sometimes initially, it'll be hard for you to stay away, but Allah will give barakah in your wealth, Allah will give barakah in your life, and Allah will keep you happy. And Allah is with it, Allah is all to understand and act upon what has been said. Subhanallah, bihamdihi, subhanakallah, wa bihamdihi, mashallah, la ilaha illa anta, and as-salatu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, 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 alh